Hi, and welcome again to my Physics Online video lecture supplement series. Today's video, we're going to begin the seventh set of lectures for the Physics 2 courses. This is our first lecture covering the subject of magnetism. So, as a brief overview, we are going to be looking at magnetism as such over the next few lectures and ultimately how it interplays with electricity and electrostatics. We are here going to be examining everything from what happens when you have a moving charge, uh, both in the sense of how does a moving charge produce a magnetic field, or maybe I should say what is the form of the magnetic field produced by a moving charge, uh, to how is it that a moving charge is actually affected by a magnetic field? What's the force between the magnetic field and the moving charge? And finally, uh, if you change a magnetic field, you can get an electric field. If you change an electric field, you can get a magnetic field for that matter. And so over the course of the next few lectures, we'll be examining some of these things. And it's worth stating once again here that ultimately a magnetic field has its source in the motion of an electrical charge or a set of electrical charges. So the origin, or maybe I should say source of a magnetic field is electric current. The first thing that we're going to do is look at what happens when you have a charged particle moving in a magnetic field. So magnetic fields we usually represent a capital B for magnetic fields. We use the capital E for the electric field and basically magnetic fields get associated with charges which are in motion. It is possible to make a sort of permanent magnet and we'll maybe discuss that very briefly but most of what we're going to be interested in here is what happens when you have particles that are charged that are in motion within magnetic fields. And basically a permanent magnet is generally associated with something that has poles, a north pole and a south pole, for example. And the poles are the magnetic equivalent of charges in that same pole will repel, opposite pole will attract, but the big difference here between a magnetic pole and a charge is there are the equivalent of charge monopoles. In other words, there's an electron, there's a proton. These are particles with either a single positive charge or a single negative charge. They can exist apart from other particles of charge. You don't have to have a electric dipole. You can have a proton existing on its own somewhere. You can have an electron existing somewhere on its own. But with magnetic fields, we have not yet discovered, and theoretically it seems that there are no magnetic monopoles. In other words, magnetic fields come in dipole. So here is the simple magnetic dipole. There's a north pole and there's a south pole. And what the idea here is, is I wanted to briefly talk about hard and soft magnetic fields. So a hard magnetic material is what's used to make a permanent magnet, such as this bar magnet. And hard magnetic materials are very difficult to magnetize if they're not already magnetized. But once you have magnetized them, they tend to keep their magnetization. So this is how you make a permanent magnet. You basically have to magnetize some hard magnetic material and then it sort of forms a permanent magnet. And this will basically provide a permanent magnetic field without having to have necessarily electrical current flowing through it. So what these are typically made of is alloys of cobalt iron nickel or aluminum nickel cobalt. 
and some rare earth elements. And these things are used any time that you need some sort of a permanent magnet. Everything from a loudspeaker to a magnetic motor to a computer hard drive is going to be using these uh, hard magnetic materials. This can be contrasted with soft magnetic materials. So soft magnetic materials are any material that can be quickly and easily magnetized. Uh, basically, if you bring it in contact with another magnet or with another magnetic field, then a soft magnetic material will tend to become magnetized. But as soon as you remove that magnetic field, the externally applied field, these materials will lose their magnetization. And so some materials that have this property, iron, nickel, nickel iron alloys, ferrites, which is basically ferric oxide and magnesium, uh, nickel, etc. So ferric oxide plus magnesium, ferric oxide plus nickel, so on and so forth. So these are some soft magnetic materials. So what are these things even used for? Well, this right here shows a basic um, use of these. They are used often as a magnetic shield to prevent signals from escaping from or being added to cables like a coaxial cable. So this right here is your basic coaxial cable. And there's a central core. Maybe the current flows in this direction through the core then there tends to be an outer material that's metal that also can carry current but then in addition to that there tends to be some metallic shield which is using soft magnetic materials and then of course the plastic jacket so that if you grab onto it you don't shock yourself and so how that works is that you basically place an iron ring around the thing that you want to shield and what happens is if you put a magnetic field that's applied to this, it gets magnetized in such a way that instead of having these field lines run straight through like this, they tend to curve around your shielded area. So that is soft magnetic materials. Before going on to talk about magnetic fields as such and how they interact with charged particles, it's worth maybe discussing one more source of magnetic fields, which is maybe the most well known of all, that is the Earth's magnetic field. And the Earth's magnetic field is actually rather similar to the field that's generated by a bar magnet. If we roll up a couple slides to the bar magnet, here is our bar magnet. Magnetic field lines come out of the north side, they go into the south side. This is a two dimensional field projection from this. Of course the actual fields are in three dimensions. The same thing happens with the Earth. It's worth noting here that magnetic south is towards our polar north, our geographic north I should say, and magnetic north is actually towards our geographic south. Why is that? Why did we name the Earth's geographic poles opposite of the magnetic poles. Well, because when you use a compass, the compass itself has a magnet in it. That is how a compass works. So the north pole of this magnet is going to be attracted towards the south pole of the earth. So hence when your magnet is pointing to north pole, the north part of the magnet is maybe here. Here's the south part of the magnet. And that basically means that the field lines are such that you have a field line terminating on the south pole of this magnet originating from the north pole of the earth. You have a field line beginning on the north part of this magnet, the north pole, and terminating on the south pole. So the geographic poles correspond to how a regular bar magnet's uh, magnetic poles will align, not to how the earth's magnetic poles have aligned. And it's worth noting also that two things here. One is that there's an angle of declination. Angle of declination is basically the difference in 
where the magnetic north pole is and where the geographic north pole is. The geographic north and south poles are the point on the Earth about which the Earth is rotating. So here's the geographic north pole. The Earth is spinning about this point. This point is basically stationary as far as uh, tangential speed would go. The actual North Pole is a little bit off from this, or the magnetic North is a little bit off from this rotational axis. It's, uh, in fact, maybe a few degrees off even. The result is that if you're using a compass and you're somewhere not really close to the pole, then it's going to still generally point you correctly to the north. But if you are really close to the north pole or really close to the south pole, then where the magnet stops uh, pointing towards north, in other words, where the magnet is sort of unable to find a particular direction, i.e. the magnetic north pole or magnetic south pole, you are not in fact at the actual geographic north pole. It's worth noting in addition to that, that the reason why we have a magnetic field from the Earth is that within the core of the Earth, we have charges that are moving. Basically, the core is molten. There are layers of core that move with respect to each other. There's charges within those layers. Those charges move, that creates a current, that generates a magnetic field. And that is where we get these field lines from. And because the, the motion of these charges doesn't necessarily stay constant over time, the direction of the poles can actually reverse over time. It's usually over millions of years. That's also why the, the magnetic north and magnetic south pole don't align with geographic north and geographic south. So let's finally actually start talking about magnetic fields as such. If you have a charged particle moving within the magnetic fields, it can interact with those fields by having a force applied from the magnetic field to the charge. What this means is that if you do not have a charged particle, it will not be affected by the magnetic field. So if the particle is uncharged, magnetic field will have no effect. And secondly, it means that if this particle is stationary, regardless of charge, then it will not be affected by the magnetic fields. Furthermore, if the, the particle lacks either charge or motion, it's going to not generate any magnetic fields. So how do we define a magnetic field? Well, we can define it kind of in an analogous way to electric field. Basically, we defined electric field by noting that the electric field was the electric force per unit charge. So this is the definition that we had for electric fields. And if you wanted the magnitude of the electric field, you took the magnitude of the force and you divided by the charge upon which that force was acting. If you want to define the magnetic field, it's a little bit more complex. Basically, we can begin by just defining the magnitude of the magnetic field. And the magnetic field is defined via magnetic force and electric charge, but also via the particle velocity, which includes a magnitude and a direction. Remember, if you have a stationary particle, it's not affected by and does not generate any magnetic fields. So this right here is your definition for the magnitude of the magnetic field. It is the magnitude of the force that that field is going to be applying divided by the charge times the speed of the charge times the sine of the angle between the actual vector magnetic field and the actual vector uh, velocity. Now note that this is a magnitude that means that all of this stuff is just magnitudes. So there's going to be a more rigorous uh, definition needed later, but for now this gets us where we need to be. We have a definition for the magnitude of the magnetic field. So what are the units of the magnetic field's magnitude? 
Well, the SI unit for magnetic field strength in meters and kilograms and seconds, the MKS units, is called the Tesla. So we represent that with a big T. And that's actually a very large field. Here is our table that shows relative strengths of different magnetic fields. So a very strong superconducting laboratory magnet generates a field magnitude of about 30 tesla. An incredibly strong conventional laboratory magnet, basically a bar magnet that's very, very, very strong, might generate a field of up to two teslas, though a much lesser field, one tesla, half a tesla, etc., is still quite strong. If you're doing a medical MRI, then you might have a field on the order of one and a half teslas. A simple bar magnet that you've positioned uh, like what you'd play with uh, as a kid, a, a very well-made one, might be 0.1 tesla, which is also the magnetic field strength at the surface of the sun. At the surface of the earth, the magnetic field from the earth is 0.5 times 10 to the minus 4 tesla, which is quite tiny. And then nerve impulses, we talked about how nerves basically can send information by exchanging some charges. Uh, so within the human brain, due to these charge exchanges, about 10 to the minus 13 tesla. Here are a couple more interesting magnetic field strengths. If you're within the nucleus of an atom, you can have a strength of up of order 100 tesla. And if you're on the surface of a neutron star, uh, this would be about 10 to the 8 tesla. So that's quite enormous. What is a tesla actually equal to? Well, it is 1 newton per coulomb meter per second. So going back to the equation, you see that this is Tesla's. Here's the force in Newton. Here's the charge in coulombs. This is meters per second, and there's no units for sine and theta. So hence the units of Tesla. The alternative unit is the CGS unit, centimeters, gram, seconds, and that is the Gauss. One Tesla is actually 10 to the 4 Gauss. So looking down here, you might see where Gauss is kind of useful. At the surface of the Earth, we have 0.5 times 10 to the minus 4. as basically 0.5 Gauss. So the magnetic field strength near the surface of the Earth is about 0.5 Gauss. So let's talk a little more about magnetic force here. The magnetic force exerted on a moving charge is actually given by Q times V cross B, where these are vectors V and B. So this is charge, this is the vector V, this is the vector B. This is the vector of the force from the magnetic field. So you can see that if we just wanted the magnitude, remember that the magnitude of a cross product is the magnitude of the first vector, which would be QV, the charge times the speed times the magnitude of the second vector, that would be the magnetic field strength B, times the sine of the angle between the two. And it's worth noting again that with a cross product, you generate a vector which is perpendicular to both of the vectors within the cross product. So here's a, a rough diagram of that. If you have a positively charged particle, it's moving in this direction, hence the V vector, and the magnetic field is in this direction, then the force that is acting upon this particle due to this field is up. So if these two are within this xy plane, then F must be along the z-axis. It's pointing up out of the plane that these two are in. And it's furthermore, you can see that if the angle theta is zero. In other words, if the B field is in the same direction that the particle is moving, 
or if it's 180 degrees, in other words, they're in exactly opposite directions. They're along the same line, but pointing in opposite directions. In either of those cases, the force will be zero because sine of zero is zero, sine of 180 degrees is zero. And similarly, this thing is maximized, the force is maximized, if B and V are perpendicular to each other. That means that theta is either 90 degrees or 270 degrees, and so sine of theta is either 1 or minus 1. Furthermore, opposite charges experience opposite forces from the magnetic field. So if this was a negatively charged particle rather than a positively charged particle, this force would be along the same line as it is now, but pointing downward. So basically in the negative Z direction. All right, let's take a look at a couple of short examples. You have an electron which is moving at a speed of 0.5 C, and it's traveling perpendicularly to a magnetic field. So if I was gonna draw this motion, maybe I would have something like the electron is right here. It's moving in this direction. V is 0.5 zero C and then it's moving through a magnetic field which is uh, perpendicular to the motion of the electron so something like this for our magnetic field and the magnetic field is given as having a strength of B equals 45 Gauss so the question is, what is the total force that is acting upon this electron? So recall that C is the speed of light. So that would be 2.9979, uh, I think 458 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. B is given here as 45 Gauss. So that is equal to 4.5 times 10 to the minus three Tesla. And the charge is a charge for an electron. So you should know that the charge of an electron is 1.60 times 10 to the minus uh, 19 Coulombs. So if I wanna find what the force is, I can find the magnitude of the force using QE V B sine theta. Since these guys are perpendicular, theta is 90 degrees. So this force is basically going to be 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs times 0.50 times 2.9979 times 10 to the 8 meters per second times 4.5 by 10 to the minus 3 Tesla times sine of 90 degrees. So the magnitude of our force in this case is approximately 1.079. So 1.08 times 10 to the minus 13 Newtons. And the follow-up question on here was what happens if we replace this direction at 90 degrees? What if the particle instead is moving at an angle of say 30 degrees with respect to the field? So if this is 30 degrees instead, uh, maybe we can change that, we'll call it 30 degrees with respect to the magnetic field. The thing that changes here is that your theta is now 30, so you have a sine of 30. Sine of 30, by the way, is a half, so if we divide this number that we have by 2, then we get what the actual force will be, and so the force is approximately 5 point four zero times 10 to the minus 14 newtons. So that's what happens if we change the angle. 
you'll notice that I only found magnitudes in that previous example despite giving a force in terms of a cross product meaning the force is a vector as all forces are has a magnitude and direction so here is the set of rules that you use for figuring out what direction they're going to be in the rule that you use is what's called the right hand rule and so the direction of the magnetic field acting, uh, excuse me, the direction of the magnetic force acting on a moving positively charged particle is found if you use your right hand. And so basically there's two ways that you can go about this. One is that you begin with your fingers pointing along the velocity vector with your right hand. Then you wrap your fingers around towards the direction of the magnetic field vector which is what's shown in this actual picture here. And so if you do that, then your thumb on your right hand should be pointing in the direction of the force acting on the positively charged particle. If you don't like that particular way of doing the right hand rule, your other option is that you can point your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field and point your uh, thumb in the direction of the velocity vector. And so if you do that, then the magnetic field is going to be pointing straight out of the palm of your hand. Um, in other words, if you pushed with your hand, it would be pushing along this force from the magnetic field. So magnetic field is along your fingers, velocity is along your thumb, the force is perpendicular to the palm of your hand. It's pointing out of the palm of your hand. Again, this is for a positively charged particle. If you have a negatively charged particle, you reverse the direction of the force, which is equivalent to saying, for what it's worth, that instead of using your right hand, you should do all this, but with your left hand. So what happens if you have an actually charged particle that's moving in a uniform magnetic field? Well, the force that the magnetic field is applying to that particle is always going to be perpendicular to the direction in which the particle is moving. And you'll recall that when you have a force which is perpendicular to an object's motion, that it causes the object to basically turn. And so what happens here is that you basically get a sort of centripetal force from the magnetic field. If the particle is moving in a constant uniform magnetic field, what that ultimately means is that it's going to make a helix, a helical path. It's going to spiral as shown in this diagram. So it starts here, rolls, comes here, rolls around, comes here, rolls around. It's basically spiraling in this direction. And if you were to look at this end on, you'd get what looks like a circular motion, meaning if V is actually perpendicular to B, then the motion will be circular only. So this right here is what happens if there's a component of the velocity vector that's parallel and another component that's perpendicular to the B field. If the velocity vector is entirely parallel to the B field then there's no force and the particle just moves in a straight line. If it is entirely perpendicular to the B field then it's going to tend to make ultimately a circular looking uh, orbit. And so we can actually look at that motion of a charged particle in a uniform magnetic field, the circular component of the motion. So this is the component of that helical path looked at end on is going to be a circle. And if the magnetic field is perfectly perpendicular to the velocity vector, then you're going to get some sort of a circular motion as a result. So the magnetic force in this case, Fb, is acting as the centripetal force Fc. Recall that centripetal force is given by mass times centripetal acceleration and that centripetal acceleration is 
speed squared divided by radius of the circle. So FC is going to be MV squared over R. Recall further that the magnitude of the magnetic force is Q times V times B, times sine of theta, but of course we're treating the part of the uh, velocity which is perpendicular to the magnetic field anyway, so that sine of theta is in fact 1. So you get QVB. Therefore, if you want to have the particle make a perfect circle within this magnetic field, you need to have the circle's radius be m times v divided by q times b. That just comes from a substitution of these equations into each other. In other words, we have that the centripetal force for a circle needs to be m v squared divided by r and we have that the magnetic force FB is equal to QVB and we have that the centripetal force is the magnetic force. Therefore we can write MV squared over R is equal to QVB. So if we want to solve for the radius of the circle we need to move this guy over here and then move these guys over to here. And so what you end up with is R is equal to M V squared divided by Q V B. And so that's M V over Q B, hence that equation. Furthermore, because this thing is moving around in a circle, the motion is in fact periodic. Over some period of time it will complete one whole revolution of the circle. So therefore we can find the period for this which is 2 pi over omega. And so let's see how we would get this equation. It says 2 pi m over qb. The implication incidentally is that omega, the angular frequency, is qb over m. So question, why is it that this is the period of the orbit? Uh, a rephrasing of that same question would be show that the period is 2 pi m over qb. So recall that we just wrote r is equal to mv over qb. And what we want is how much time for one revolution. So that would be equivalent to the period. Well, time in general, you can figure out a, a delta time by using the fact that delta x over delta t is the average speed. Now this thing's average speed is its instantaneous speed in this case because again this is a circular motion. That means that there is no speeding up or slowing down. So this in this case would just be V. So we can rearrange this to get that delta T is equal to delta X over V. And if we want this right here to be the period, then this right here needs to be the circumference, which is 2 times pi times r. And look, we've got an r up here. So that means that t is equal to 2 times pi times mv over qb, all divided by v. And so you can see that this v and this v cancels and therefore the period must be 2 times pi times m over qb. And since period is equal to 2 pi over omega, the implication is that the angular frequency omega is qb over m. So that's where this comes from.
Our discussion so far has largely consisted of the motion of a particle in a uniform magnetic field. Now granted the force for a magnetic field on a charged particle that applies generally. It is QV cross B. Finding the magnetic field strength locally also is true whether the field is uniform or not. But actually applying magnetic fields to the motion of a particle so far we've looked mostly at a uniform field. So now I want to talk a little bit about what happens if you have a non-uniform magnetic field. And the discussion on non-uniform magnetic fields is going to be not as mathematically rigorous. If you want a more mathematically rigorous treatment, I'd recommend maybe taking a, a more advanced course on electromagnetism. The main thing that I wanted to mention is what's called magnetic mirrors. And basically what happens is that you get a region of very high magnetic field strength. Note that these are magnetic field lines and just like with electric field lines, the more lines you have per unit area, the higher the magnetic field strength is in that region. What happens is that you get a particle and it passes from a region of low magnetic field strength into a region of high magnetic field strength and at some point basically reverses motion. And what this is due to is some combination of the radial component of the field and the azimuthal or circular component of the particle's velocity. And that's basically if you look at the force in these cases as the particle is moving towards this field, uh, this part of the field, the force is in this direction. And so it has a component along the plus z direction and then another component that is somewhere in the xy plane. That's the force. And then similarly as it gets towards this region, it has a force that is towards the negative z direction and then another component in the xy plane. And so the force actually along the z direction reverses direction. So this perpendicular force, the force that's actually perpendicular to the motion of the particle, reverses direction and therefore causes the particle ultimately to reverse direction. So it sort of reflects off of these two points where we have very high magnetic field strength compared to low magnetic field strength from which the particle has been moving. So these two points effectively act as mirrors. So the particle hits the mirror, reflects, comes back this way, hits the mirror, reflects, comes back this way, hits the mirror, reflects, and so on. And one of the big uh, applications to this is the creation of our Van Allen belt. And so the, if you have two opposing magnetic mirrors, as in the previous picture, you get what's called a magnetic bottle. And so the particle gets trapped between these two mirrors. And each mirror, basically, as, as you approach each mirror, the particle's translational velocity gets reversed. That's the z component of its velocity. And the Earth, as it turns out, forms a sort of magnetic bottle. If you look at the field lines from the Earth, you can see that they're very dense around the two magnetic poles of the Earth. They're relatively less dense elsewhere, so these are where the magnetic mirrors are. A charged particle gets ejected from the sun. Sun basically consists of plasma. Plasma is a set of charged particles, some positive, some negative, but all the positive particles behave in one way, all the negative particles behave in another. So any time that there's an eruption from the sun's surface, it means that a bunch of charged particles are getting blasted out of the sun's surface. And that's basically the solar wind, for example. And they're going to get trapped as they pass through the Earth by the Earth's magnetic fields. And so these 
trapped particles then end up getting reflected from one end to the other of this magnetic bottle and they form what's called the Van Allen belts. So that's not the only time that we get some charged particles that interact with the Earth's uh, magnetic field. A more dazzling version of this and maybe more readily viewable is what's called the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights. And what this has caused is that you get these charged ions from the solar wind approaching the Earth near the poles. And so the velocity component that is parallel to the field lines carries the particles towards the poles until they get reflected. And the perpendicular component of the velocity, that's the component that's perpendicular to the field, basically confines the particles, thanks again to this uh, magnetic bottles effect. And so what this picture is actually showing down here this is the aurora borealis and then this is a picture uh, this part of the picture is actually showing a portion of the milky way galaxy and if you look very closely in this picture you'll also see a third uh, for lack of a better word astronomical phenomenon which is a shooting star you can actually see a streak right here from some meteor uh, falling through the atmosphere um, so you've got a meteorite and so this is kind of a neat astronomy picture for what it's worth. In any case what happens with the aurora borealis is that these ions get concentrated very strongly near the poles and that's because the field lines are very dense near the poles and so if we were to scroll back up to the Earth's field lines here. These particles are basically going to be confined around a field line. You'll notice that the field lines are very dense near the poles. That means you've got a lot of ions confined in here compared to out here per unit area or per unit volume even. So out here you've got one, you've got one here, you've got one here, you've got one here, but in here these guys are really close together. And so even the particles confined around each of these field lines would be confined in here, if you want to think of it in terms of that. So this means there's a dense number of ions near the northern pole and some similarly towards the southern pole of the Earth. So what happens is that you get more collisions between charged particles and air molecules in these regions. And each collision basically causes some ionization. Electrons get ripped three of the air molecules. And then when the electrons recombine with the atoms in the air, they release photons, uh, light. And that's why we get the northern lights or the southern lights. There's so many collisions happening here that what you see is the photons from recombination of these electrons. If you move towards the equator though, there still are collisions because there's still confined ions in these regions. Again, the Van Allen belt extends sort of all over the place. But these collisions are relatively rare because the density of charged particles is much smaller near these equators than it is near the very north uh, or the very south, basically near the two poles. Hence, you see aurora, uh, the aurora borealis near the poles, but not near the equator. So if you have a charged particle and it's moving in a region where there's both a magnetic field and an electric field, then the total force acting upon that particle is sometimes called the Lorentz force. And it's basically going to be charge times the E field plus the cross product between the V and the B, the velocity and the B field. So here's a diagram of what that would look like. You have your charged particle. It's moving with some velocity V at some angle with respect to the B field. There is also an E field somewhere. The result is that you have 
on the one hand a force due to the E field, which is going to be in the direction of the E field. It's a positively charged particle. And in addition to this force from the E field, you also have a force from the B field. So here's the electric force, here's the magnetic force. And if you want to get the net force acting on this particle, you have to add these two forces as vectors. So here's the net force. It's the E field force plus the B field force. Since the E field force is Q times E, and since the B field force is Q V cross B, the total force can be written in this manner. And therefore, if you have both the E field and the B field, the motion of your particle is going to be a combination of the motion that would have been due to just the B field and the motion that would have been due just to the E field. In other words, you're going to get some sort of a corkscrew motion. With that said, the contribution to the motion from the E fields is probably going to be making the particle speed up or slow down. In fact, because the particle is sort of corkscrewing about, the E field will make it either speed up or slow down. And if the particle speeds up, then the gyration radius has to increase. If it slows down, then the gyration radius has to decrease. That's just due to the fact that you'll recall the radius was found earlier in today's lecture, which was this MV over QB radius. So if you're speeding up the particle, that means that the radius has to increase. If you're slowing it down, then the radius has to decrease. So this spiral ends up looking like a corkscrew because either it's speeding up, in which case the radius is getting uh, larger and larger and larger, or it's slowing down, in which case it's tightening up. So one interesting application of all this is what's called a cyclotron or a cyclotron. Cyclotron is an early type of particle accelerator. It actually was invented by E.O. Lawrence and M.S. Livingston. Uh, those of you who work in the sciences may or may not have heard of, for example, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory um, or the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Both of those are named for this guy, Lawrence. And they're both in California for what that's worth. Um, nice places to visit, nice places to work even. Uh, basically what happens is you want to accelerate a charged particle to a very, very high speed. The point is to get charged particles to be moving near the speed of light for various applications. And this thing makes use of both the E field and the B field. So in this diagram, you can actually see the direction of the magnetic field lines. And you can see the direction that the particle is moving in. And then your electric field line is basically alternating according to this square wave pattern. And so basically the field is sometimes in this direction, sometimes it's in this direction for the electric field. And what happens is this charged particle ends up moving in a spiral through this cyclotron. So it starts off here, it makes one loop, it's speeding up because it's being accelerated by the electric field, it's spiraling thanks to the direction of the magnetic field which is perpendicular to this plane in which the particle is actually moving. And so it basically speeds up, hence the magnetic field's uh, gyration radius is getting larger, speeding up some more because of these field lines. Radius gets larger and it just spirals out until it exits from the cyclotron at very high energy. And what happens is that you have two containers, they're called D's, and they're named that because they are shaped like a letter D, more or less. And the electric field basically exists in the gap between the two D's. So that's where the particle is actually getting accelerated. So a particle gets accelerated, then it's on a circle, then it hits the field again and accelerates. 
and then it hits the field again and accelerates hits the field again accelerates and so that's why it makes this motion like this and the b field is just there to keep it on the semicircular motion in between the times when it's interacting with the e field now recall that there's there's basically going to be two parameters that you need um, of interest for a cyclotron. One is the cyclotron frequency, which is also the frequency at which the electric field should alternate. Omega C is Q B over M. So that's the frequency of alternation here. If you take one over this, excuse me, if you take two pi over this, you get the period of this electric field. So the period is how much time from here to here. Half the period is how much time should the electric field spend in this orientation and how much should it spend in this orientation. The other interesting parameter is the exiting energy for an ion, which is mv squared over 2, which is q squared, b squared, r squared over 2m. Um, recall, though, this right here, omega c is qb over m. You've already actually seen that equation earlier in this lecture. Namely, we talked about the motion of a charged particle in a uniform magnetic field and that it has a circular component. Well, we're back to uniform magnetic fields because the field inside of a cyclotron is actually uniform. Um, period was given by 2 pi m over qb, but that's also 2 pi over omega. That means that omega is qb over m. That was what we derived earlier. So sure enough, the cyclotron frequency is in fact the frequency that we earlier derived, the frequency for the motion of a charged particle in a uniform magnetic field. So this thing is in fact using just a simple uniform magnetic field. Here the side view is basically showing how you get that uniform magnetic field. You basically have the equivalent of a north pole magnet, the equivalent of a south pole magnet, and then you do the same thing down here, north pole and south pole. So within the Ds, there is a magnetic field. In between the Ds, there is no magnetic field. Hence, between the Ds, the particle moves straight. Inside the Ds, it moves along a curve. And the end result is that you're able to accelerate a particle to a very high energy given by this equation. And so this is Q squared, B squared, R squared over 2M. So Q is, of course, the charge of the particle. B is the strength of this magnetic field that you're able to muster. R is basically the radius of the D. And then M is the mass of the particle. And what these things are used for is basically they're used a lot in hospitals these days. And they produce radioactive substances to, for diagnosis, for treatment, if you want to do like radiation therapy, that kind of thing. Okay, another interesting application for the Lorentz force, and again, this is uniform. You can use a uniform electric and a uniform magnetic field, or a quasi-uniform electric and magnetic field, is that you can make a velocity selector. So a velocity selector, you basically make the electric field and the magnetic field perpendicular to each other. So this thing is showing a magnetic field that is pointing into the screen, showing an electric field that points from left to right. So this is like a pair of parallel conducting plates. Here's your uniform E field, here's your uniform B field. You have a source, you shoot a particles through a slit, particles coming from this source, they're charged, they move through this slit, and the E field basically starts pushing the particle to the left. So, uh, excuse me, the E field is pushing the particle to the right. So this is the force from the E field. E is to the right, the particle is positively charged, therefore the particle wants to move to the right from this E field. B is into the page and V is in the upward direction. So if you take B cross, or excuse me, if you take V cross B, you get a force pointing to the left. So if you have Q times B, uh, 
excuse me, Q, the charge, times V, the velocity, crossed with B, the magnetic field, you get the force from the magnetic field. And basically, what you do is you choose for the force from the electric field to be equal to the force from the magnetic field. And that means there will be no deflection of this particle. And if there is no deflection from this particle, that means you could put, for example, another slit up here, and only the particles at this desired speed will make it through. So you adjust the E field and or the B field to choose the speed that you want. V needs to be E over B. So if you wanted a speed of whatever, one meter per second, then you need to have E over B equal one meter per second. So that would happen if, for example, the E field is uh, one uh, uh, Newton per Coulomb and the B field is given by something like uh, one Tesla. So that's how you choose your velocity. There's a further application to this though, which is that you can make a mass spectrometer. And so your velocity selector can be used not only to choose how fast a particle is going to be going as it exits from this whole system, but in fact can be used to, rather than choose a speed, measure the speed of the particles. And so you place your second pinhole at the end of this pair of parallel plates. That means there's no more electric field out here. There is, however, a magnetic field. And what happens is the particle passes through this pinhole and only has the force from the magnetic field, which basically, again, is perpendicular to the plane in which the particle is moving. It's a uniform magnetic field. The particle is not going to speed up or slow down. It's just going to move along a circular orbit. And then you have some detector array that maybe, for example, lights up when a particle collides with it. And basically what that means is that the ratio of mass to charge, m over q, is r times b naught over v, or r times b naught b over e, if you'd like. And what, what this basically is telling you is if you know what the radius is of this circle or the semicircle that the particle has traveled along from when it leaves the pair of parallel plates to when it crashes into your detector array, if you know what that radius is and if you know what the magnetic field out here is, B, then, and you know what the speed of the particle is, V, then you can get the ratio of the mass to the charge. And so this is, for example, how you might try measuring the mass of an electron, because remember, we've already discussed an experiment in which the charge could be measured. That was the oil drop experiment. And again, remember that you can choose what the speed of the particle is. It's going to be the ratio of the two fields here as per the velocity selector discussion. Therefore, knowing all that information, you can measure what the mass of an electron is or what the mass of a proton is. Alternatively, since at this point we already know what the uh, mass of both an electron and a proton is, alternatively, you can set this up without the velocity selector component to it and you can set it up so that if you have an experiment and you don't know what the uh, speed of an exiting particle is, you can now measure what that speed will be. And that's without needing to have the E field and B field at known values here. So I wanted to finish out this part of my lecture set 
by first of all working a longer example and then second of course a final set of summary slides and then roll the credits if you will. So let's have a look at this example. All right, so we have a proton and it's traveling perpendicular to the Earth's magnetic field near the Earth's surface. And the field is pointing north, the proton is moving straight down. So let's draw ourselves the Earth. Recall that the field lines basically start at the South Pole, wrap around, and then end at the North Pole. So the field lines, this obviously is not uh, to scale entirely, but the field lines are something like this. Start here, they start here, they end here, they end here. You have a particle that's moving perpendicular to the field line. So locally the field line is like this. It's basically north. So here is B. The particle itself is moving basically perpendicular to that, which is stated in the problem as straight down or straight towards the Earth, V. And we're given that V is uh, 1.00 times 10 to the 4 meters per second. We're given the information that B is 0 0.5 Gauss as per the Earth's surface. So that means that B is 5 times 10 to the minus 4 Tesla. Uh, excuse me, 5 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. It's 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 4 Tesla. So the question that we're asked then is in part A, what is the magnitude of the magnetic force? So magnetic force magnitude is going to be Q V B sine theta. So for a proton, Q of a proton is about 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And in fact, since we're only using about one significant figure here, I guess we can basically write that the force is 1.6. I'll go ahead and keep two sig figs just for fun, times 10 to the minus 19. We'll assume maybe that this is 0 0.50. So 5.0 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. And then Last but not least, B uh, is this one. The V is 1.00 times 10 to the 4 meters per second. And they are perpendicular, so we have sine of 90 degrees, which is 1. Therefore, this force is going to be 8.0 times 10 to the minus 20 newtons. So that's how much force is going to be acting upon this proton. Part B of this same question now says what is the magnitude of the acceleration? So Newton's second law F equals ma therefore A is F over m. If you're an engineer you might call this two of the forms of Newton's second law. So in any case, A is F over M becomes 8.0 times 10 to the minus 20 newtons divided by the mass of a proton. Mass of a proton is about 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. You can look that up in the second set of my lectures, the first part of that set for a physics two lectures. So if you plug all that in, 
This means that A is going to be approximately equal to 4.7904. So that would be basically 4.8 times 10 to the plus 7 meters per second squared. Third part of the question, part C, what is the direction in which this force is acting? So now we have to look at these vectors. And the way that we look at these vectors is we notice that if we start off with our fingers pointing this way and we wrap them for our right hand so that they are pointing towards B, then the direction should be whatever direction our thumb points in. So when I hold my right hand like that, I see that my thumb is actually pointing out. So the direction would be represented by this. So what direction is that? Well, um, east, basically. So acts to the east. And you can tell that that's east because this right here is the geographic north. This is the geographic south. This red arrow represents straight down towards the center of the earth, not west. And so, therefore, what's perpendicular to north and perpendicular to down? Well, east or west. And poking out of the page would be east. Poking in would be west. Part D then asks, what changes in your answers if the particle is an electron instead? So maybe I should actually alter this one like this. So what is different if you have an electron? Well for starters the direction here is going to change. So force acts to the west. And the magnitude of the force is unchanged. F is unchanged. A, however, will be changed because now we have 8.0 times 10 to the minus 20 newtons divided by 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms because that is the mass of an electron. So that means that the total acceleration now is going to be somewhat larger than what it was before. Uh, now the acceleration will have a magnitude A equals 8.781, so 8.8 .8 times 10 to the plus 10, so about three orders of magnitude more than what we had here, meters per second squared. So the two things that really changed by flipping the sign uh, the two things that really changed by flipping from a proton to an electron are the charge sign changed, therefore the direction will change from east to west, but the mass also changed, so the acceleration will change from 4.8 times 10 to the 7 to 8.8 .8 times 10 to the 10. There's been quite a few new uh, topics introduced in today's video. Um, all pertaining to magnetic fields. There's also a few old topics with a new twist to them. So the main new topic of course is magnetic fields. I stated that they are caused by charged particles in motion. I didn't do anything with that because we're going to look at that in future lecture sets and future parts of lecture sets. The more important thing to today is that a magnetic field acts upon a charged particle which is in motion and this other charged particles clause is because it's they do not act on the particle which is causing them but we'll see that later so there's a source particle which is a moving charge there's another particle that the field that is generated is interacting with the magnetic field strength can be defined analogously to the electric field strength but in this case it's f magnetic force per unit charge times speed times sine of the angle between them. 
the magnetic force itself is given by the charge times the cross product between the particle's velocity and the magnetic field. This means that it will be zero force if there is zero charge, if there is zero speed, if there is no magnetic field, or if the velocity and the magnetic field are parallel to each other. So the magnetic force also will be perpendicular to both the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector. That's due to the fact that it is a cross product. If you have a charged particle which is moving in a magnetic field, it's going to experience a magnetic force that causes it to take on a motion that has a circular component to it. If it's a uniform magnetic field, then you can ultimately find the radius and the period for the motion given the magnetic field strength, given the charge, given the mass. So the radius, the gyro radius is mass times speed divided by charge times magnetic field. The period is two pi times the mass divided by the charge times the magnetic field. If you wanted to get the angular frequency, it is uh, period is 2 pi over angular frequency, so the angular frequency is charge times field strength divided by mass. The Lorentz force is in turn the total force experienced by a charged particle which is moving through a combination of an electric field and a magnetic field, and it's given by this equation, charge times electric field strength plus charge times the cross product of the velocity and the magnetic field strength. In other words, it is the force from the electric field plus the force from the magnetic field. At the very beginning of the lecture, I talked a little bit about soft and hard magnetic materials and about the Earth's magnetic field. Remember that the Earth's magnetic field strength is about 0.5 Gauss, which is about 5 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. The other thing is that opposite magnetic poles attract, like poles repel, and as far as we know, there are no magnetic monopoles. In fact, theoretically, there should be none. All right, time to roll the credits. So most of these are my usual sources, the OpenStax book, the uh, Cengage books, one for algebra-based and one for calculus-based physics, and of course Pearson's book that DC Giancali puts out. Of course, I always have a few sources in addition to that. Um, there's actually quite a few sources on this one. And really, I think I've given due credit to all these folks. So thanks for watching my video and hope you found it helpful.